Now on BBC Four, get out your glad rags and your sky-high heels for a celebration of the trailblazing queens of British pop. In 2009, it seems as if men are running out of things to say. Female artists suddenly rule the charts. But they're far from the first to balance beehives, give up their private lives or sing heartbroken soul. This golden generation didn't get here alone. Women's lives weren't always in colour. The women who came before them have not only been there and done that, but they've got the back catalogue to prove it. This week we celebrate the trailblazers, the stars that lit us up from the early 60s to the late 70s. We give you our first Queens of British Pop. is amazing and whose looks are amazing whose voice is amazing is it a bird is it a plane is it a tree no 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 it's a bush perhaps all our women led to our final star she lit up the late 70s and beyond half carnal half dream time and always under her own strict control Kate Bush I can't think of anything before Kate Bush that was like Kate Bush. You know, she came out seemingly from another planet. Her voice in general is just incredibly captivating, isn't it? You're just sort of like, eh? What is that? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, Kate Bush and her grand piano, well, that's like John Wayne and his saddle. You know, thank you. A GP's daughter, the 11-year-old Kate, started writing songs in her childhood home in Welling, Kent. I could never do it in front of people. I've never been able to. And if I do, I automatically feel that the fact that it's a performance, because as soon as you have someone in the room with you, I feel you should give them the best. You should perform. They were very, very quirky at that age. And then around about 13, 14, they started to take a structure musically and uh, in the lyric content. And so something like Man With A Child In His Eyes was showing the potential of her music. A demo tape found its way to EMI. I remember when I got into EMI, there was literally a mantra, uh, birds don't sell. It struck me that she was so unusual. The songs were unusual, the voice was unusual, everything was pretty well unique. I signed the contract and there was just feelings that we weren't sure how to handle it. I mean, I myself felt that I was very young at that time. Signed at 16 and given 18 months to learn exactly how to be Kate Bush, she released her first single in 1978. When I first heard the finished version of Wuthering Heights, I thought, this, is, this has got to be a hit single. And I remember at the time that she had some disagreements with the people at EMI about which should be the first single. She just put her foot down and I gave in. I said, we'll put Wuthering Heights out, it won't work, and then you'll have learned a lesson. And of course, I was 100% wrong, and she was 100% right. The day after she'd been on top of the pops, everybody at school was saying, yeah, who was that girl? I remember my mum, I told rest her soul, when she first heard Kate Bush and I played it, brought it home, didn't I? Oh, jolly, it sounds like a bag of cats. <laughs> I 
At first it seemed absurd, the leaf, leaf, way up there. But it isn't at all. It fits. Those shrieks and warbles are beauty beyond belief to me. Hello, Kiwi! We've also got for you four, not one, four Kate Bushes. With success, Kate found herself on the old promotional treadmill. Hello, I know it's back to school for a lot of you, and I hope you're not too excited about that to enjoy the programme. I'm very happy today because my guest is Kate Bush. Welcome, Kate. Hello. But Kate and Light Entertainment were at times a bizarre mix. She'd turn up at a television station expecting to be interviewed seriously, only to find that they were ready to talk to her about her boyfriends or something. One last question from Jane Fear about your hair. What do you do to it? She loves it. <laughs> In 1979, Kate was to prove she was more than my music and song. There was this anticipation. Everybody had seen the videos, everybody had heard the music. Could she actually do it live? When she took the decision to go on tour, no one doubted how important it could prove to her career. The show was epic, incorporating song, dance, mime and magic. Stretch, stretch and dance. When I told people I was working on the tour, I mean, my position was elevated immediately because this was really the big, big pop, it was more than pop event. Not only was it the pop event, it was like a theatre event of the year. It was the pinnacle, at that time anyway, of the realisation of everything that she was working for, visually, sound-wise, musically, and it was an extraordinary achievement. I'm knocked out. I can't believe that audience. Worth that three months' um, hard work? Oh, well worth it. I, I'm just completely knocked out, really. When she went out and did it, she said, it was almost like, well, there you go. You know, I can do it, you know, and, and I, I can do it bloody well. <laughs> Like Kate, her tour was a one-off, and she retreated into the studio. Don't you have a problem now? You're just over 21, and you've made it. What is there left to do now? Everything. Kate continued to create music that always had a sense of intrigue. It's not always easy to read. Again, there's that sense of mystery. Um, she makes you work a little bit for it. I remember I couldn't actually figure out what she was saying when I was younger. It's only when I kind of looked at lyric sheets and stuff. Well, actually, not even lyric sheets. Googled them, <laughs> showing my age. She surprised me with all the, the, the clues, and it's up to me to put the answer together. Well, that's the Koran of music. And that surely is what we're all looking for. No easy answers to anything. Of course, she was taking quite a risk, because in those days, lots of people thought that girl pop singers shouldn't be involved in anything to do with politics or philosophy or whatever. She's in the trees. It's coming. When I was a child, running in the night. By 1985, with five albums under her belt, Kate was now in complete control, recording and producing her own music and the accompanying visuals. You're a very determined girl. You went away on your own terms to make this LP, didn't you? What makes your studio special? Well, it's got all the environmental things that we want, the right kind of sounding rooms, and mm. it's uh, what we want, which is why we did it. <laughs> You say we all the time. It's, it's very much, though, a very solo sort of thing. I mean, you've produced the thing, you've written the thing. I'm in control, but there's no way I could do it by myself. I rely on people around me to advise me. I think she was one of the first female artists that started uh, a sort of creative community around her and controlled it um, and shaped it, really, and was just 
unafraid to experiment for better and for worse. Stepping out of the public eye and into her own creative world meant Kate made herself unintentionally even more mysterious. If there is a reluctance to get involved with the media, it's because she doesn't want to play with the bullshit. And through those years where people say, you know, she hid away from the world and so on, she was just making records. It might take 10 years to do it. And then if that's the way she works, that's the way she works. She'd proved that there are no real rules. If you want to do it this way, you know, do it absolutely in the personal way that you see it. And I think that a lot of artists found that incredibly empowering. It's not about rolling in the money. It's about the joy of knowing that what you've done really does touch people's hearts. Okay, you just can't beat that. We take it for granted now that women are going to, you know, produce themselves, write their own music, be responsible for themselves, have their own management companies. Back then, in 1978, that was all new. You know, so she's definitely a pioneer, a serious pioneer. Kate Bush set a new standard of creativity and control. The women who followed her from the 80s onwards have also struggled to create and manage their own destiny. They've looked back into the past and stared into the future to become our next Queens of British Pop. <laughs>